Hello everyone. Welcome back to the channel. This is episode three of Early Muslim Expansion. Sorry for the fan in the background. You won't notice it once the video starts. I went back a little bit because as soon as I got to the video, it started playing. So I kind of took it back a little bit. Um, been a good series so far. And um, I'm going to shut up. We're going to get into the video. If I can hit the right button. It is not clear why, as Arab and Persian sources are conflicted, but according to the former, Bahman gave command over his army to another general called Jaban, who marched with the entire army to where the Christian Arabs were concentrating. The Persian sources claim that Bahman returned to Tesiphon with his entire army. Meanwhile, Khalid moved his troops towards the city, and sometime in May, fought the allied Christian Arab and Sassanid army near Elis. The details of the battle are lost, but we know that the Muslims won. The sources are once again conflicted on the number of casualties, with the Arab sources stating that Khalid's force killed 70,000 enemies, mostly through the executions after the battle, while the Persian- Holy shit, that's a lot of death. There must- so did they surrender and then he just wiped them out because that's a dick move so it must have been um, like they were they were fleeing I'm gonna guess and he just they were chasing after him and just killing them that way writers think that the army facing Khalid's 18,000 was comparable in size and managed to retreat towards al Hira after a minor defeat in any case, in the last days of May, Khalid approached al Hira, which was the initial goal of his campaign. Again, the sources are inconclusive. We know that the local Sassanid garrison and their Arab allies mounted resistance for a few days, but eventually the sides decided to negotiate. As Khalid promised to spare the lives of the population in exchange for the payment of the Jizya tax, the locals decided to surrender. The Arab commander spent the next few months building up a new administration in the region and collecting taxes. At the same time, raiding parties were sent to central Iraq and towards the border of the Eastern Roman Empire, and this raiding brought both loot and information on enemy movement. Hmm. Some sources claim that the Caliphate gained a degree of control over central Iraq, but it seems that Khalid didn't have enough troops to keep such a wide region under his authority. Still, the Caliphate's raiding parties were not getting much resistance to the north and northeast, while his scouts informed him that the Sassanid garrisons to the northwest were still intact, with larger concentrations at Ambar and Ain al Tamur. The first one was further away, and the direct route to it was through Ain al Tamur, but attacking the fort of Anbar would have been more unexpected. So, in late June of 633, Khalid left half of his troops in Al Hira and marched west towards Ambar with a. It would have been unexpected, yes, but it's also riskier because you're going through more land. You have the chance of being seen, you know, by other towns. But it doesn't look like there was a whole lot of towns there. But you know, you run the risk of still your your army's marching. Sorry. Ten thousand strong army. I like this game, is it a video? I'm guessing a game. Anbar would become the first Arab attack across the Euphrates River. The details of the engagement that happened here are unclear, but it seems that Khalid's decision to attack Anbar surprised his opponents, and the leader of the garrison, Shirzad, was forced to surrender after the Arab archers showed their effectiveness. Then, the Caliphate's raiding parties approached the town of Ain al Tamur from the direction of Al Hira. So, when Khalid engaged the Sassanid troops, mostly made up of Christian Arabs from the west, in July, he was able to win with relative ease. The leader of the Christian Arabs was taken prisoner and then executed, and the city surrendered to the Muslims. Hmm. Events of the next few months, between July and September, are shrouded in mystery as some sources claim that Khalid was staying in Ambar and Ain al Tamur, slowly setting up the administration of the newly acquired region, which seems uncharacteristically passive for him. 
Others claim that the last two remnants of the apostate activity of the Ridda Wars were to the south, so Khalid moved most of his non-garrisoned troops towards Dormat al-Jandal and helped his fellow Caliphate general, Ayad bin Ghanim, defeat the rebels in the region. This inactivity or absence gave some time to the Sassanids, and they started recruiting and concentrating five armies in the area between Muzayyah and Husayd. Kaka bin Amr, who was left to command the garrison at al Hira, ordered the raiding parties in central Iraq and the garrisons of Ambar and Ain al-Tamur to take positions to the south of the Sassanid forces, delay them as much as possible, and not allow these four small armies to unite into one force. At the end of September, Khalid returned to al Hira alongside the troops he picked up around Dormat al-Jandal and ordered Kaka bin Amr and Abu Layla to lead portions of the garrison to Husayd and Kenafis respectively and take command, while his troops rested in the city. Apparently, small Muslim and Sassanid armies fought minor battles in October, and the Sassanids suffered minor defeats, which compelled them to retreat towards Muzia. Khalid now had an open route to the Sassanid capital, Tessiphon, but the Sassanid army at Muzia and the concentrations of the Christian Arabs in the area between Sani'i and Zamil were still a threat, so the Caliphate commander decided against attacking Tessiphon. The main Sassanid army at Muzia probably considered its position to be safe, since it would be difficult to attack them without going through Sani'i and Zamil. At the same time, Khalid knew that attacking the majority light cavalry Arab Christians could push them to the north to unite with the troops at Muzia, so Khalid devised a plan. His army was already divided into three corps, and they moved directly against the Persians using the desert to avoid Sani'i and Zumail. This was technically very difficult, as all three corps had to not only bypass the enemy armies without being detected, but also arrive at the decided location simultaneously. It was risky, but the possible reward was also high. Everything worked as planned. Khalid's corps converged on the target at the same time, and during one of the nights in the first week of November, his 20,000 attacked the sleeping Sassanid army of comparable size. The latter was not expecting this attack, and the army of the Caliphate scored an easy victory killing more than 10,000 Sassanid warriors. After that, defeating a smaller Christian Arab force seemed easy, but instead of confronting them head-on, Khalid repeated his three-pronged maneuver to avoid losses. The Muslims suffered minimal losses, while the Christian Arabs lost more than half of their army. Apparently, a few recent Muslim converts were among the killed, and their families sent an appeal to the Caliph Abu Bakr to punish Khalid. This rejected appeal was sent through the future Caliph Umar, and will become important for our story down the line. Okay. Khalid's mobility and the inability of his opponents to consolidate their forces meant that the region between Muzayyah and al Hira was now under the control of the Caliphate. We have sparse information on the early administration of these lands, the Muslim sources claim that while the Persians living in the cities were often taken captive and enslaved, the local Arab population was forced to pay the jizya tax but was otherwise allowed a degree of autonomy and even freedom of worship. That's kind of what you got to do. You can't control them entirely. You want to make it better under you than it was under them to make them stick with you. The tax probably sucks, but if you pro still provide them the ability to go about their life and maybe enhance it some way, you win. More raids were sent across the Euphrates in the next month, while Khalid was contemplating what his next move should be. Uh, question. This and this. I don't see... I almost said a green hat. I don't see that. So I'm guessing these two aren't in his control which it's on, I'm going to say the south side of the river, I'm just the southern side, of, at least of this. So I'd figure he'd want to take these, which maybe that's what he's going to do now. And I'm just looking at the total control aspect of, you know, this side of the river, 
But he, but he does have a, a toe in here, in Anbar. I don't know. I'm trying to Attacking guess. Tesaphon was still dangerous, as that would have stretched the supply lines too much. That made an attack on the only Sassanid target in the area, the city of Firaz, the only option. Firaz was right on the border of the Sassanid and Eastern Roman empires. Khalid and his 20,000 reached the area in December. Once again, the sources are conflicted, but a few details that have reached our times allow us to form a coherent timeline. We know that the local Sassanid and Roman garrisons united their strength on the north side of the Euphrates, while Khalid held the crossing on the other side. Despite the fact that the Muslim sources state that the united Roman Sassanid force was large, it is fair to assume that neither empire could have a large force in the area, since the Sassanids needed those troops in central Iraq, while the Romans were concentrating their own forces on the crucial coastal areas and urban centers already being raided by the smaller Muslim armies. Even with a united force and the inclusion of the local Arab tribes, the Allies, led by the Sassanid commander, Hormoz Jadiyi, probably had between 15 and 25,000 troops. For five or six weeks, the armies remained opposite each other, as neither side had a safe place to cross the river. It seems that sometime in the third week of January, Khalid slightly retreated from the positions he held, perhaps <laughs> baiting his counterpart into attacking. Yep. Indeed, the Allied force crossed the river and formed up against the Muslims. And now you can pin them against the river. Did my voice just... You can pin them against the river. Or they're going to funnel into that bridge. And it just... They can't all fit and you can just be, you know, killing them from behind. Both sides had a similar disposition, with infantry in the center and cavalry on the wings. The Allied army charged the Muslims, probably hopeful that their heavier equipment would give them an advantage. Slowly but surely, this charge pushed Khalid's lines back. Simultaneously, the Muslim general ordered the cavalry units from the second rank to leave the main body and take position to the far left. The Roman Sassanid army continued to advance, and the Muslims retreated even further. Khalid's detached force was ordered to take the bridge and then attack the Allies from the rear. This maneuver was successful, and Hormuz Jadiyi's army immediately started losing cohesion. The Allies thought that there was another big Muslim army that took the bridge and would soon surround them. Simultaneously, Khalid's main force started their counterattack and those units of the Allied army not killed on the spot started routing towards the northeast. A certain number managed to swim across the river, but more than half of the Allied army was killed. Khalid lost a few hundred from his ranks. Khalid was about to attack deeper into Persian territory, but he soon after received a letter from the Caliph Abu Bakr at the Rashidun capital of Medina. The letter ordered him to cease his attacks on the Sassanids and to move into Syria to battle the Romans. So Khalid and a small contingent of his army prepared to move west. As with the Mesopotamian invasions, there had probably been no better opportunity for a strike into Roman lands, as the destructive quarter-century-long conflict from 602 to 628 had undermined crucial defenses in both regions. The Roman East, with all its religious, cultural, financial and strategic significance, was now dangerously vulnerable. During 633, the Muslims sent four separate corps to invade Palestine, in addition to the areas around the Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan and the Dead Sea. Though they achieved success, assaults on the large urban settlements of the region could not be considered until reinforcements were brought up. So, both for the additional troops and for Khalid's expertise in warfare, Abu Bakr sent the order for him to move west. Mm. To save time and to bypass Roman defences, the Muslim general chose a more dangerous route through an especially desolate, waterless stretch of the Syrian desert. Mu I'm not doubting anything that he's going to do so far. 
because it seems to work. To the alarm of his subcommanders. <laughs> yeah. In order to survive, it is reported that Khalid, in his ingenuitive way, ordered 20 camels be forced to drink large amounts of water so that they could be used as makeshift storage tanks. The beasts were then periodically slaughtered along the journey when nourishment was needed, and the water was then harvested from the camels. Jesus. After five grueling days of marching through this desolate landscape, the 9,000-strong Muslim army emerged at Suwa. Then they swiftly inflicted a minor defeat on the Roman Arab clients, the Ghassanids, at Marj al rahit while they were celebrating Easter. Proving his strategy correct, Khalid's improbable desert crossing had also neutralized the Byzantine defenses on the Arabian border. Now he turned south, towards the Syrian town of Bosra, where the arrival of his reinforcements led to its capture by mid-July of 634. Despite this success, the Muslims had little time to celebrate. Roman Emperor Heraclius, who was now in Emesa, sent his brother Theodore and an Armenian general named Wadan south towards Ajnadain, 25 miles southeast of Jerusalem where they began to gather a large army. Spies troops. reported this gathering force to the invaders, and the burgeoning caliphate's army marched to meet their Byzantine opponents. Assalamu alaikum. Oh. This is an urgent appeal for the people of Yemen. The suffering in Yemen right now is truly unimaginable. 79 uh, I think I'm, if they're about to battle, I'm going to stop it. Very few hard facts. I, I, I don't want to jump into the video and then stop it in one minute. So I'm just going to, I'm going to end it here. Uh, I got to do a couple things and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to finish this uh, to the hour mark. So, um, like and subscribe or uh, vicious drive by and it kills your genitals. It's a lot of genital death. All right, have a good day, have a good night.